our Associate Administrator, Nikki Fox. And finally, I'd like to introduce to the stage Dr. Lori Glaze, who is our Division Director for NASA Planetary. All right, all right, all right. So good to be here. Always fun to be at the Hyperwall and fun to uh, give you all some updates and some really cool stuff that's been going on in planetary science over the last few months and uh, maybe some highlights of some things that are coming up soon in the future. So let's start uh, just a real quick uh, sense of where we are, what is planetary science, uh, where we are at NASA. We have a program right now of 39 missions uh, in our portfolio, but I am going to hone in on a few of these. Right now I want to talk about what we just got through. Uh, we just all survived what we called Asteroid Autumn, which was an amazing uh, confluence of big milestones for several of our missions focused on, uh, on studying and understanding asteroids in our solar system. We have so many missions looking at asteroids because of course, you can find different types of asteroids in different parts of the solar system, different types of asteroids, different populations in different parts of the solar system, and each of these can tell us something about the earliest formation and evolution, um, that where we came from. These are the leftover remnants of those early building blocks that built up the planets and the moons across the solar system, and so now we can go out and we can see these uh, early kind of fossils that are left over in the solar system and learn something. So let's talk about some of these. I'm going to start with OSIRIS-REx. So OSIRIS-REx is a mission that visited the asteroid Bennu, which is a very carbon-rich asteroid. It is a near-Earth object, which means that it periodically flies by pretty close to Earth. It is potentially hazardous asteroid. Don't have to worry, there's no chance of it uh, interacting with Earth for at least the next hundred years. Uh, but, really interesting asteroid. Uh, we uh, rendezvoused uh, with, uh, with Bennu back in, I think, early 2019, late 2018. Surveyed the asteroid and then in, in October of 2020, uh, we descended into uh, Nightingale Crater on, on Bennu and collected a sample that we could bring back to Earth. You can see that there, the, the sampling system taking the sample. And then, uh, this is us returning back to Earth. This is what kicked off Asteroid Autumn on September 24th. We can see the uh, sample return capsule there descending through, the, uh, through Earth's atmosphere. And there it is on the parachute, the little red and white striped parachute hanging there underneath, uh, the, the sample hanging underneath the parachute. Um, what an amazing day that was. It was incredible out in the Utah desert this spot-on, perfect landing of, of the, the entry system in the desert. So now we have these samples. Um, they are now back on Earth. You can see in the top right there, there's the sample return capsule where it just nested and landed nice and gently on the desert floor. Um, you can see the PI, Dante Loretta there, standing over the capsule making sure that everything's safe before we start uh, bagging up the capsule. And then we carried it back to a temporary clean room um, out at the Utah Test and Training Range. Um, and here we are uh, opening up uh, the, uh, the canister. And this is what we saw inside, which is a fair amount of material that actually had escaped outside of the sample collection head. Um, and this was pretty amazing. We, we knew that we had a little stone in there that was holding the sample uh, container system open um, and allowed a lot of the fine grain material to, to be outside of the sample head. But this was amazing. We knew we had a pretty good sample here as soon as we saw that. Um, let me go back and just uh, see if I can figure out how to go back. Uh, so we're in the process now of, of analyzing that sample and trying to get it all containerized. It's down at Johnson Space Center. Uh, where it's now being uh, uh, tested and we're, we're, we're looking at uh, trying to really understand exactly what we have. One of the things that's really amazing is we went to this asteroid, we went to Bennu because we thought it was going to be very carbon rich. The type of asteroid that likely uh, delivered the kinds of organic molecules that were the seeds of life on Earth and perhaps in other places across the solar system. And as we're studying this sample, we are finding it is indeed very carbon rich. It also includes a fair amount of hydrated minerals, water-based minerals that 
or could also be the source of water that would be delivered to Earth and other, other types of, uh, of missions. So what's incredible about sample return, why this is such an important uh, way to uh, study uh, the, the materials in our solar system is once we bring them back, we can then study them for decades and decades to come. We can use the state-of-the-art instrumentations and laboratories that we have here on Earth today, all of our scientists around the world studying these samples, but then we preserve a large amount, 75% of the sample that we return, re we've returned, we're gonna save that for future generations so that we can continue to study these samples. New scientists that aren't even born yet with ideas that they wanna test that we can't even think of right now using instruments that haven't even been invented yet. And this is just an example of some of the other sample return missions that we've had in planetary science going all the way back to uh, the Apollo mission where we've really demonstrated the importance of, of being able to preserve these samples for decades and decades. We have now just recently in the last few years opened some of the Apollo samples that had never ever been opened before and were able to again analyze these samples using instrumentation that, as I said, wasn't even invented or even thought of 50 years ago when those samples were collected. Pretty amazing. And now we are, here's OSIRIS-REx, and we're planning forward now for the Artemis III missions where we hope to bring back additional lunar samples. And then, of course, planning forward for samples from the Mars system, both from Japanese Mars Moon Explorer, bringing back samples from Phobos, um, probably in the early part of next decade, and then Mars sample return, bringing back samples from Mars. So the next big event in our asteroid autumn was the launch of the Psyche mission. Psyche is a really interesting mission. It's going to visit an asteroid called 16 Psyche. 16 Psyche is interesting. It is a metal asteroid, a M-type asteroid. And why do we care about that? It's a really unique asteroid. There's actually only about nine of these metallic asteroids that we know of out of the millions that have been, uh, that we estimate are out there in the, in the asteroid population. And these metallic asteroids are potentially, this one's the largest, Psyche is the largest of those metallic asteroids, potentially is an exposed metallic core of an early planetesimal. And you say, well, how do you do that? Well, the idea is that perhaps you had uh, the, uh, the, uh, the growth of this early planetesimal, and then if it in, uh, had a, an impact from a larger asteroid that would have blown off that lighter crustal material on the outside, could expose that interior metallic core uh, for us to be able to see. We can't normally see the inside of a planet. You can't see the inside of Earth. You can't see the inside of Mars or Mercury or the Moon. But with Psyche, we may be able to see what that looks like. So that's one of the big hypotheses that we'll be testing with this mission. We launched um, in October, and now uh, on our way, uh, in, going to rendezvous with Psyche at the end of the decade. So the last big event from Asteroid Autumn is around our Lucy mission. The Lucy mission is uh, going to eventually uh, get out into the... Uh, outer part of the solar system is designed to explore what we call the Trojan asteroids. So this is yet another population of asteroids. The Trojan asteroids lead and trail Jupiter and its orbit around the sun. Um, so kind of a unique um, population uh, of uh, asteroids. You can see them here in that Jupiter orbit out here leading and trailing Jupiter. But on the way out to the Trojans, uh, we are actually flying through the main asteroid belt. And just on November 1st, we had the opportunity, we were, were lucky we were able to uh, identify an asteroid in the, main, in the main asteroid belt called Dinkanesh that we could fly by with the Lucy spacecraft and test some of our software, test out the spacecraft operations, in particular something we call the terminal tracking uh, technology that allowed us to target in on that asteroid and then autonomously rotate the spacecraft so we could keep our high resolution images focused on the asteroid. So we didn't actually expect to get a whole lot of science out of this uh, flyby. It was really just to test out the technology. It wasn't supposed to be a particularly interesting asteroid. Uh, but this is what we found. Um, and I think we have another slide here that shows more. 
What we found out when we flew by was that it wasn't just a single asteroid, it was actually a double asteroid, a binary asteroid. And then what we saw, you can see it here with the moonlit kind of uh, rotating around, but as we backed away, it turned out that that little moonlit you can see on the right was in itself also a contact binary asteroid. So just from a dynamic standpoint, and how do you form this type of a system, and how, do, how prevalent are these types of asteroids in the solar system, and what can they tell us about those early dynamic processes that form these, uh, these pieces of rock that are floating around? Uh, this is really going to be a phenomenal scientific find and something that's going to be studied, I think, for quite a long time. So very fortunate and very uh, fortuitous, but a lot of fun. So now uh, let's uh, kind of look forward a little bit. What's some of the things that we're excited about coming up in planetary science, um, particularly in 2024? This is going to be a huge year for the moon and for robotic lunar exploration. And we are really, really excited about this. We're, really, we're going to be kicking off with the commercial lunar payload services. If you haven't heard about these, this is a new way of doing science within NASA. These are not NASA missions. We're actually buying services from commercial companies, commercial entities. We have several of these commercial companies on contract. And when we have a NASA payload, we would like to fly to the surface of the moon. We write a task order. And then they sign up. They win these contracts, win these task orders to provide a delivery service to the surface of the moon. They provide power, thermal control, communications. Um, but they're really not our missions. We're just flying our payloads. We've been running this program from the, since 2019, and the first two launches of the Commercial Lunar Payload Services are coming up in January. First two launches, first two landings coming up the beginning of the year. This is really exciting. It's been an experiment. Keep in mind, these commercial companies have never landed on the surface of the moon before. Um, you know, they may land soft, they may land hard, but they will learn about what it takes and we have 10 of these already on the manifest, and so we will learn. Our whole objective in this program is to invest in the commercial capability so that they can build that capability, get us more frequent and lower cost access to the surface of the moon for science. So we're really, really excited about these. In addition, after that, after the commercial lunars, we actually expect there could be two more commercial launches later in the year. I'll get to that. But we also have a big uh, solar eclipse coming up in April. Um, and I keep reminding all of my friends in heliophysics that you can't have a, an eclipse without the moon. Yes, the sun is always there too, right? But it's not an eclipse until you have a moon that's standing in the way. So we're very excited to participate in the, in the solar eclipse. And as I said, then two more commercial launches later this year. Uh, we're thinking later in the spring or summer will be the second launch of, of one of our commercial providers uh, for a landing on the moon. But in addition, they're going to carry a small spacecraft for us called Lunar Trailblazer, which is going to map out water on the surface of the moon. Looking at subsurface water, near surface water, trying to understand its concentration, what the form of the water, um, and helping us better understand where you might find that resource on the moon. And then later, at the very end of the year, we're hoping to use, again, another commercial launch and commercial lander to deliver our Viper rover, which is going to explore some of the uh, permanently shadowed regions near the south pole of, of the moon, getting us real ground truth data, being able to dig into the regolith, drill out some of that material where we think there very well could be water ice buried beneath the soil and really get, as I said, some ground truth to help us interpret the remote sensing data we have for the moon. And then our last big event for 2024 that we're really excited about is that next October, October 10th, the launch window opens up for the Europa Clipper mission. This is a really big mission. We've been working on it for over a decade, a, a spacecraft that is designed to help us really understand the environment of Europa, the moon of Jupiter. This is an icy moon that's covered in an ice crust, but there's a global ocean beneath that ice crust. And so we believe that it's potentially habitable within that ocean world. If you've got thermal systems, hydrothermal systems at the base of that ocean that are driving thermal cycles, driving chemical cycles within the ocean, 
it's certainly possible or plausible that there could be life. So this mission is going to characterize Europa, help us better understand how thick is the ice crust, how deep is the ocean, how salty is the ocean, what is the material that sits on top of the ice, looking at the organic materials. Europa Clipper is going to actually go into orbit around uh, Jupiter um, in 2030 and execute about 50 uh, flybys of Europa to, to better map out and help us better understand Europa. So we are very, very excited about that. And with that, I'm going to close this out with a special feature. As we're getting prepared for the Europa Clipper launch in October, uh, we have uh, brought in the Poet Laureate uh, from uh, the Library of Congress. Her name is Ada Limon, and she wrote a very special poem. I love the fact that we are not just focused on the science, but also the importance of bringing in art and science to help us reach broader audiences and connect with people on an individual level. So I really would like to share Ada's poem with you. Hopefully it's loud enough you can hear it. Of Mystery, a poem for Europa. Arching under the night sky, inky with black expansiveness, we point to the planets we know. We pin quick wishes on stars. From Earth, we read the sky as if it is an unerring book of the universe, expert and evident. Still, there are mysteries below our sky. The whale song, the songbird singing its call in the bough of a wind-shaken tree. We are creatures of constant awe, curious at beauty, at leaf and blossom, at grief and pleasure, sun and shadow. And it is not darkness that unites us, not the cold distance of space, but the offering of water. Each drop of rain, each rivulet, each pulse, each vein. Oh, second moon, we too are made of water, of vast and beckoning seas. We too are made of wonders, of great and ordinary loves of small, invisible worlds, of a need to call out through the dark. So we are sending Ada's poem to, In to Europa um, as uh, our message in a bottle from one ocean world to another. It's going to be engraved on a chip um, that will be carried on the spacecraft. If you would like to send your name on the spacecraft, engraved on that chip as well. You still have a couple more weeks to get that done. You have till the end of December if you'd like to send your name to, uh, to Europa. So that is coming. And with that, I think I can take questions. Thank you very much.